All right, good afternoon. Um, after we're done here, I will leave the podium to my friend, Mr. Brendan Varmer, to speak on behalf of the President of the General Assembly. Yes, Benno, that's him. Yeah. Um, yes, then at 12.30, uh, Liu Jemin, the Under Secretary General and Head of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, along with Stefan Schweinfest uh, and Francesca Groom of the Statistics Division in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, will brief you on the World Women 2020 trends and statistics, so do play, stay connected. That will be done all uh, virtually. And while we are on the subject of statistics, today is actually World Statistics Day. In his message, the Secretary General stressed that statistics are fundamental for evidence-based policymaking. Currently, timely and reliable data uh, help us to understand the changing world in which we live. He added that the coronavirus pandemic has further elevated the importance of data to save lives and recover better. More information on the website. Um, the Central Sahel region is at a breaking point. That's what the Secretary General said in a pre-recorded video message prepared for today's high-level pledging event for the humanitarian crisis in that region. The security situation has deteriorated sharply, and humanitarian needs in the border region between Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger have reached record levels, he added. COVID-19 is making it all worse. The Secretary General said that the appeal for an immediate global ceasefire is crucial for the people of Central Sahel. The downward spiral needs to be reversed with a renewed push for peace and reconciliation. He also called for more humanitarian assistance, for space to reach people in need, and for more investments in development. With better funding, we can do much more, he said, as he urged member states for strong support. And the emergency relief coordinator, Mark Lowcock, um, also participated in the meeting and sounded the alarm, saying that nowhere in the world worries him as much as Sahel in the medium term. The results of the conference, uh, we want to thank over the 20 donors who have pledged over $1.7 billion to scale up life-saving humanitarian aid for millions of people in Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. This includes $985 million for this year and $704 million for 2021 and beyond. Once released, the funds will help some 10 million people for the remainder of this year through 2021 with nutrition, food, health services, water and sanitation, shelter, education, protection support to survivors of gender-based violence. The full list, final list of pledges and donors will be available later today on the interweb. And uh, back here, the Secretary General spoke uh, virtually at the, to the Security Council at its meeting this morning on the Persian Gulf. He reminded members that he, appealed, he has appealed for an immediate global ceasefire to focus on one true fight, the battle against the COVID-19 virus. And the Security Council has joined this call. Regarding Yemen, he said that fortunately for now, hostilities have subsided, but this is not enough. He added that we need an immediate ceasefire and return to the negotiating table to work out political settlements to end the war. Nothing else will suffice. Looking at the wider Persian Gulf region, the Secretary General said that it is clear that tensions are running high and confidence is low. Since May 2019, he added, a number of security incidents have raised tensions to new levels, heightened concerns over larger conflict. The Secretary General recalled the role of the Helsinki process in dealing with the tensions of the Cold War, and he hoped that it would be possible to establish a similar platform for the Persian Gulf, starting with a number of confidence-building measures. These may include, for example, the ways to combat COVID-19, promote economic recovery, ensure unhindered maritime navigation, and facilitate religious pilgrimages. Turning to Lebanon, we, along with our humanitarian partners, are continuing to deliver assistance to those most in need following the explosions over two months ago in Beirut. Um, since the beginning of the response, more than 36,000 people have benefited from protection services. Nearly 83,000 people have received in-kind food parcels, covering 72% of their known needs to date, while 12,500 metric tons of wheat flour have been distributed, covering approximately 80% of affected stocks. More than 27,000 people have received cash assistance since August. Rehabilitation of shelters remains one of the main areas of ongoing work for us and our partners. Nearly 4,000 households were reconnected to their water supplies, 
covering two-thirds of the known needs estimated, and more than 3,300 water tanks, 235 pumps, were also installed since the beginning of the response. The UN coordinated response plan for the Beirut port explosion is seeking $355 million, targeting 300,000 people in need, but it remains less than 29% funded. Beyond religious, be, excuse me, beyond humanitarian assistance, Lebanon will continue to require substantial and long-term assistance to support recovery, reconstruction, and economic reform. And uh, I've been asked for an update on our, the situation in the Kyrgyz uh, Republic. I can tell you that we continue to monitor developments in the Re Kyrgyz Republic closely. Our special representative for Central Asia, Natalia German, continues her engagements in Bishkek. Today, she met with the Prime Minister and Acting President of the Kyrgyz Republic, Sadir Japarov. In her meetings, she has highlighted the need to ensure that decisions on the way forward are within the country's constitutional and legislative frameworks and are being made in an inclusive and transparent manner. We remain ready to support all efforts to that end. And Ms. German will continue her meetings with relevant interlocutors in Bishkek throughout the week. And on the COVID front uh, in, Kyrgyz, in the Kyrgyz Republic, um, our colleagues there from the UN country team, uh, led by resident coordinator Ozonia Ogielo, continue to work with authorities to address the impacts of the pandemic. The World Health Organization has just delivered 1.5 million medical masks to the Ministry of Health for health workers across the country. Due to procurement and distribution challenges resulting from the pandemic, we've also been providing supplies for people with diabetes. UNICEF provided 4,000 insulin doses, half a million insulin syringes, and 230,000 blood and urine glucose test strip, as well as containers for used syringes. These supplies will be distributed to medical facilities across the country, including in remote areas. We're also procuring another 20,000 doses of insulin to cover the needs of 650 children and adolescents for the full year. And ahead of a virtual donor conference this week to raise funds to help the Rohingyas inside and outside Myanmar, the UN Refugee Agency today stressed the need for stronger international support and a redoubling of efforts to find solutions for the stateless and displaced population. On Thursday, UNHCR, together with the US, the UK, and the European Union, will host a, the conference, which you can follow online. Less than half of the funds requested for the humanitarian uh, response have been received so far. And an analysis released today by the UN Children's Fund, the World, World Bank Group, reveals that an estimated one in six children lived in extreme poverty before the pandemic, and this is set to worsen significantly. The analysis notes that sub-Saharan Africa accounts for two-thirds of children living in households that struggle to survive an average of $1.90 a day or less per person. The international measures for extreme poverty, ex excuse me, the international measure for extreme poverty. South Asia accounts for nearly a fifth of these children. UNICEF and World Bank warned that any progress made in recent years is concerningly slow-paced, unequally distributed, and at risk due to the impact of the pandemic. And our friends in Paris at UNESCO today launched an international awareness campaign highlighting the devastation of the history and identity of peoples wrecked uh, by illicit trade in cultural goods, which is estimated to be worth nearly $10 billion each year. Real Price of Art campaign shows that in some cases, the looting of archaeological sites, which fuels this traffic, is highly organized and constitutes a major source of financing for criminal, criminal and terrorist organizations. The campaign marks the 50th anniversary of UNESCO's Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export, and Transfers of Ownership and Cultural Property, adopted in 1970. Just wanted to flag that today we launched a virtual photo exhibit called The World We Want in advance of UN Day to mark 75th anniversary of these or United Nations. The virtual exhibit is a special collection of 75 photos curated for more than 50,000 images from 130 countries. It is a creative response to the Secretary General's call to hear directly from peoples of the world about their vision for the future. The exhibit features winning images from the World We Want campaign, a photo uh, competition hosted by the mobile app Agora in support of UN75. Go to UN.org. Uh, well, you'll find it from UN.org. And um, tomorrow at 1.30, there'll be a virtual press briefing by Olivier de Schutter, the UN Special Representative on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights.
Speaking of human rights, you have rights to ask questions. Mr. Bayes, for now, that is, yeah. Not uh, a sort of subject matter. It's simply watching this morning's Security Council debate, which was virtual. Um, we would like to have seen the Secretary General on full screen. Instead, he was on a tiny little screen. For television broadcasters, that means that speech is lost to history. That will never be shown on television because it's not of broadcast quality. Um, and this isn't the first time this has happened. Uh, thank you. I raised this issue with our colleagues this morning that part of it has to do with the Interprefy platform that they use uh, for their meetings. Uh, they will work uh, moving forward on getting a separate feed of the SG's uh, speeches when this platform is used. So they're trying to find a workaround uh, for this. Does there happen to be a separate recording of the uh, that's, Secretary General? Uh, on this I don't believe there is. I asked, and I don't believe there is, uh, but I will double check uh, again. Okay. Uh, anybody on uh, Apostolis? Yes, please. And Be then Beitul. Apostolis, if somebody could unmute our. I've never heard Apostolis muted, so let's. I, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. This, that's, that's, that's the voice I know. Go ahead. Uh, could you please provide us some uh, uh, details uh, regarding uh, the next move of the Secretary General on Cyprus uh, following the selection of uh, a new Turkey Cypriot leader? Do you know if he's going to deploy Mrs. Lut for exploratory talks? Is Mrs. Speher going to do subtle diplomacy? And also, if you can confirm that the UN will host a dinner of the two leaders next, next week, as it was reported uh, in Cyprus. Okay. Um, on, on your last question, we'd have to check. Uh, I'd have to check and get back to you on. But I can tell you that, obviously, we've taken note of the election of Mr. Tatar as the new Turkish Cypriot uh, leader. The Secretary General, for his part, remains committed to supporting both sides in revitalizing the uh, political process to explore the possibility of convening an informal five-plus uh, UN meeting with both leaders as well as the guarantor powers at the appropriate uh, stage. You know, I think it bears underscoring again the importance of trust building between the two communities, and we encourage the continued development and implementation of confidence-building measures, which would bring, obviously, the two communities closer together. Uh, the Secretary General further calls on, on the two sides and all relevant parties to avoid any unilateral action that could undermine the prospect for renewed negotiations. You know, as the way forward, uh, I think the, the best way to resolve the disputes is by returning to negotiations, by fostering lasting settlements of long-standing Cyprus problem for the benefit of all Cypriots and greater peace in the region. Um, and that's it. I will leave it at that. Uh, Betul, sorry, go ahead. Actually, have a follow-up in Cyprus and a couple of other questions. Does the Secretary General have a time framework uh, to bring the two parties together? Because what you said before was that he was planning to convene a meeting among the two leaders and and the current four countries. And if I may, I have another question on um, Nagorno-Karabakh issue. Uh, the foreign ministers of Azerbaijan and Armenia are meeting uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, uh, on Friday in Washington. Uh, does the Secretary General have any plans to meet the ministers of both countries? And uh, another question on the second issue. You have issued a couple of statements concerning uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, and uh, I'm just wondering, there was no mention or reference to the Security Council resolutions or um, UN generally, uh, General Assembly resolution, uh, because, I mean, we see that uh, in some other conflicts that the UN is guided by Security Council resolutions. Just wondering why there hasn't been any reference to those resolutions. I mean, as a, matter, as a matter of, of principle, we're obviously always guided uh, by resolutions adopted by, uh, by, by member states. I think for uh, the current conflict in, uh, in, the, in the region, uh, the Secretary General's message has been clear, is a return to negotiations under the auspices of the Minsk co-chairs. 
Um, this has been the message that also Rosemary DiCarlo delivered to the Security Council uh, yesterday. Uh, I don't have a, uh, sorry, and on the two uh, foreign ministers, no, he, the Secretary General has spoken to both um, last week, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, which Tuesday, last week, uh, and delivered the same messages he's been delivering uh, publicly. I'm not aware of any plans at this point for either of the two uh, gentlemen to stop uh, through uh, through New York, um, and no, I don't have a time uh, a time frame for uh, a convening of a of a of a meeting with uh, the parties, the guarantor powers, uh, and the UN. Obviously, we will. Uh, these developments are fairly new. The election took place uh, over the weekend, uh, but discussions will will be ongoing. Okay, um, let's see if there are any other questions. Uh, Stefano, please, and then Gloria. Stefano? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you, Stefan. I have uh, two questions. One is about Colombia, the case of uh, Mario Paciola. Um, Sunday, um, the magazine Semana in Colombia published the result of the autopsy done by the Colombian authority, where they confirm that Pachola committed suicide. I mean, for them, that was, it was a suicide. It's not, uh, you know, they, they confirm what they had said before. So uh, the Italian authority instead is still going on with the investigation. Uh, I would like to know what the UN is uh, doing at the moment to, to about this issue. The second question is about uh, uh, the 18 uh, fishermen from Mazzara, Sicily. They are still held in Libya. Um, Sunday, the Pope, you know, the Pope, talked uh, about them and uh, linked their, um, they linked the situation to the to the discussion for the uh, you know for peace in Libya because uh, he was talking about it he hoped that uh, the the discussion go ahead that, that those fishermen can be free so so my question is uh, um, what the UN and the Secretary General are they doing anything for those uh, eighteen fishermen that are still held in Libya. Stefano, we would hope uh, that these people are released. I will try to check exactly what the UN mission may be doing, working to that end. Uh, on your first question, um, uh, I, I completely understand the, the, the continued uh, interest in this, tragic, uh, in this tragic case. For our part, we are continuing to cooperate with the Colombian investigation as well as the Italian investigation. And those, that cooperation and those investigations are ongoing. Gloria, please. And then we'll leave it to Brendan. In case of just a quick, uh, sorry, sorry, Stefano, just a quick uh, follow up on, the, on Colombia. But do you, does the UN, what does the UN take about the result of the, um, I, I, the it's not, it, it's not for me to, it's not for me to comment while an investigation is ongoing. Sorry, go ahead, Gloria. Uh, in the case of the Sahel, where all the villages are being pillaged and where the cattle are being stolen, etc., cetera, uh, people have heard the need for help and investment. But what investment in agriculture would be safe where the farmers can still reap the results of these of the investment? Because investment and investors are people who expect financial reward. They're not goody good two shoes people. Well, I, you know, uh, I'm not sure we're talking about direct private in investment. Where we obviously we, there needs to be an investment in peace, um, and the peace will create the climate in which people can invest and and in which farmers can invest in their own uh, in their own production and reap the rewards and reap the 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 the, uh, the rewards of that investment for their families and for their communities. But what we actually need is also is also peace. Uh, which we currently don't have in many parts of the region. Okay, uh, sorry, Bitchul, you had a quick follow-up? Bitchul? 
Okay, I don't hear her. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry, I go ahead. Myself. Go ahead. Go ahead. I can't hear you, Beitul. Sorry. You're, you're breaking up. Okay, listen, I think um, we'll move on to, to Brendan. Uh, if you can hear me, Beitul, just give me a call and I will answer your question. I'll leave you in Brendan's uh, hands and then... Uh, we'll go to the Undersecretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. Thank you.